Okay. You guys ready to go? Ready to start the knee pain workshop? Good, good. Um, like I said, we have people here in the audience, in the live audience. Uh, no heckling, please. Somebody said everything is backwards here on our end. Yeah. Uh, text and everything will appear backwards online. That's just how Facebook Live is. So, uh, <laughs> so bear with me if you're online. And here, the text will appear normal. And then I'll flip the board and write it backwards. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, so um, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Luke Gordon. I'm a physical therapist, uh, owner of Gordon Physical Therapy. And today's topic is shoulder pain, as you all know. Sorry, that's my standing joke. It's really corny. But uh, my other standing joke is that it's a three-hour class, but it's just an, it's just an hour. Um, and we'll see, we'll see what questions you have. But thank you for coming to the workshop or tuning in online if you're online. And um, the point of the workshop today is to allow you guys a little more time to digest more information about knee pain with an emphasis on what causes it, how do you know what's causing your knee pain, how do you figure out what to do about it if you feel like you know what you're doing between stretches, exercises, injections, surgeries. Because everyone's knee pain is a little bit different and we just have to figure out what yours is like in order to figure out what to do with it. So that's the whole background of the workshop. Just give you more information about what you can do with this. Um, you know, some people obviously need surgery at some point, but I, you know, from a physical therapy standpoint, my personal bias, of course, is that we'd like to help you avoid that at all costs, or at least delay it. I know Harold said he's planning on living to be 100, so you know, the later you do surgery or not at all would be, would be uh, great. So um, one of the ways I like to start the workshop is just by kind of getting a little bit of feedback from you guys. So if you don't mind, uh, Joy, can I pick on you first? You want to tell us a little bit about your knee pain and what's going on? Oh, I'm not sure if it's just my age and I'm wearing out. <laughs> There's something I can do. It's the stairs, going up and down stairs, getting up from a chair. Stairs, getting up from a chair. Just really chair stuff. Yeah. Just walking, I have no issue. So walking on like level ground is just fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it both knees or just one? Both. Okay. And then how about any surgeries? None. No surgeries. Wow. Yeah, okay. Anyone else here not had a knee surgery before? You've never had knee surgery either? Okay, okay, all right, so 50 50. You haven't I, either? I don't even have a problem. I'm just here here. Okay, <laughs> you're, just, you're just here to support your husband. Very good. This is my ear, ears. Yeah. <laughs> good. Owen, you, you want to tell us a little bit about your knees? Yes. My knees trouble started 35 and 33 years ago with two different traumatic injuries to both my knees. And then that's the last time I was able to walk or, or run, jump, or jog 33, 35 years ago. Until 10 years ago, roughly, I could walk normally with uh, no pain. And then the osteoarthritis kicked in, uh, induced by those 30-some year ago injuries. Yeah. And so I was bone on bone roughly 10 years ago. Okay. And bilateral okay both needs have been replaced yes. um, on the same day. gotcha that's what the bilateral part means. yes oh on the same day too yes. wow okay that's, that's the bilateral word. yeah 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 both sides yep very good okay so both knees replaced Chris never had any surgeries awesome and then Harold do you mind if I just kind of paraphrase what you told me earlier um, so had a partial knee replacement on the right in 2014, something went wrong, the meniscus got out of whack, ended up having a full knee replacement in 2015, and nothing on the left and hoping to keep it that way. Good. Total knee replacements are fascinating because um, some people have both of them, and both knees appear to wear out kind of consistently, and then a lot of people just have one. And you say, well, what's the difference between the left knee and the right knee? How many steps you've done, how many stairs you've done, how many times you've gotten up and down from a chair. Um, and, and a lot of times what the difference is between one knee and the other is a previous traumatic injury, like you mentioned, Owen. There's something about these traumatic injuries, even when you're like a teen or in your 20s, or Harold, when you were a runner. Um, Harold was an avid runner. Um, there's something about these previous injuries that seems to accelerate the degenerative process of the cartilage. Um, and I don't think the, the doctors and surgeons quite understand exactly what that is, but there's something that, that usually links a total knee with a previous injury. Did you have any specific like running injuries to the right knee when you were running in college and stuff? Nothing? 
No, like skiing injuries or ACL injuries. Yeah. Gotcha. Could have been an issue back then. Yeah, even as back um, as 12 years old, something like that. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. And what we're going to cover in the workshop then is, okay, is it an arthritic knee? Is it more of a muscle issue? Is it, uh, you know, cartilage? Is it meniscus? Things like that. And just give you guys some more information about um, how to figure that out and get down to it. Because ultimately, you just want to be able to choose the best course of action. Um, the thing with knee pain which is pretty similar to a lot of other types of pain, is that if you were to ask like 10 of your friends, if you have 10 friends, I have three, um, but if you had 10, just for a round number, if they had knee pain, you might even get half of them that have knee pain at any given time. Um, obviously, as we get a little older, that, might, that number might go up a little bit. And so there's a lot of people living with knee pain, and um, people can live with pain for a long time, um, especially in your generation. You know, you guys aren't complainers, you're workers in general. Sorry to stereotype you but hopefully you appreciate that one. Um, so people live with knee pain all the time. Where they eventually start to seek help with knee pain, whether it's from their doctor, their physical therapist, the orthopedist, um, you know, their neighbor, Google, YouTube, where they start to look for help is when the knee pain gets in the way of specific activities. So like walking, running, jumping, getting up and down from a chair, um, stairs, things like that. So that's when we tend to see clients as physical therapists, is when it's gotten to a, a threshold where you say, wow, if I don't change this, my activity level is declining, or if this gets any worse, I'm afraid I won't be able to do stairs, sit to stands, uh, play with the grandkids, whatever it may be. Does that sound fair enough to you guys in the audience? So I mentioned a few activities. Any other activities that people are real concerned about wanting to be able to continue to do or that they've lost? I thought I should bring up, since you were mentioning running injuries a few moments ago, that first injury to me was my seventh bloom day, Bloom's Day, 35 years ago this month. I stepped in a pothole oh. sideways and made nice crispy noises as I went down. Oh, yeah, one of those beloved potholes. I always liked those playing hoop fest. Made the game more interesting. That was the end of my running career. Yeah, yeah. So running, I'm not sure if anyone here is looking to run again necessarily, although some people at home might be looking to run. Definitely uh, an issue, you know, um, for some people. Anything else, Chris, that we missed on activities? Yeah. And that's how a lot of our clients are. I mean, we do have some younger clients who are more into the active, uh, you know, running, cycling, whatever. But the majority of our clients are just like you guys here, um, where all you really want is to maintain that level of mobility and independence. Um, and I think it starts to weigh on your mind a little bit if you say, well, hey, I'm having a hard time with the stairs. What if that gets worse or, I don't, or it doesn't get better? You know, am I going to have to make some difficult decisions about life at some point? So... So good job being proactive, being at the workshop, and hopefully um, you'll learn some stuff today that will give you encouragement. And as we go along, I want this to be as interactive as possible, so ask questions whenever you want to. We're going to go through that worksheet now. Um, I'm just going to check with the folks at home. I don't know. Everything is backwards. Okay, got that. I don't even know how to look at this. If you're watching at home, I, I sincerely apologize. But hopefully it still works. Okay, I think we're good so far. Uh, I'm going to go through the worksheet. And um, like I said, ask questions along the way. I'm here for you guys to learn, okay? I think one thing that's important to people my age, maybe a little older, but I like to drive, and I like driving a long time, but in and out of some cars, I see people really struggle. I do a little bit, a little bit. That's a good point. That's a good point. Getting in and out of a car. Yeah, that has a lot to do with your independence too, doesn't it? Yeah. The shape of, of si or size of the door is the big deal. If For the car? If there's a high sill and you have to lift your leg up, there yeah. isn't enough room uh, in front of the seat to get your leg squeezed in. Yeah. 
and then it's a low seat for a lot of cars too. So yeah. Okay, so um, so let's dive right into the worksheet here. Um, you guys all have a copy of it. You guys good to go? Take notes. Like I said, it's not a test. I'll actually fill in the blanks for you. And um, I had a dream last night that I couldn't find my sheet. And hopefully I know the answer is anyways, since I created it. But I, I, I just feel more comfortable having the answers. And if you don't feel like writing, I can certainly print it off for you before you go to. I guess that's an option. Okay, so um, number one is why is knee pain so common? Like I mentioned earlier, if you ask your friends, a lot of them have it. So what's going on? Well, first off, so let's just understand the anatomy of the knee a little bit. So your knee actually has three distinct joints. So that first word is joints. For the folks at home, I don't think I'm going to write it on the whiteboard for you since it's backwards. So there's three joints in your knee um, as well as four different bones. Now, this is usually where I try to draw something. Are you guys ready for that? Okay. No uh, giggling. These are like cartoon dog bones, okay? Okay, let's pick a knee here. Okay, so this would be your right knee. So we've got, on the way down towards your knee, we've got your femur, longest bone in your body, right? So that's your thigh bone. Here's your femur in dog bone cartoon drawings. There's your femur. Anyone know what this bottom bone here is that comprises basically the bottom part of your knee? Tibia. tibia. Yeah, femur, tibia. I just write this down. Sorry, Facebook. Femur tibia. Any idea what this little, this little bone on the outside is? You want to take a crack at that one? It's similar to tibia. tibia. Fibula. Yeah, so you got your fibula over here. Now we left one out, right? That one right there. Patella. That's your kneecap. So kneecap is that second blank there on your worksheet. So you've got these bones, your femur, tibia was basically your shin down here. Fibula is that little skinny bone on the outside. If you trace it all the way down, it's the outside bone of your ankle too. And then um, on the top there is your kneecap, patella. So that's just the basic anatomy. You've got a lot of muscles surrounding your knee too. And the biggest group of muscles in your body is this one right along the front of your thigh. You want to take a crack at that one? There's four of them. Quadriceps, yeah. You got your quadriceps. So that's your blank word there, quadriceps. You could just put quads if you want to shorthand it. So there's your quadriceps. There's, of course, other muscles that are involved with your knee. Uh, I'm just kind of keeping it pretty simple for now. Quads are on the front. You tend to think of your hamstrings along the back of your knee, especially you know if you're a runner, you're probably pretty familiar with your hamstring, probably even had a problem with it at some point. Um, and then you've got other muscles like along the groin and things like that. And the only reason I want to mention all these things is because you need to be aware of all of the things that affect your knee when you're looking at what's causing the pain. Certain muscles, again, could it be the bones. Uh, the next one on our list is the, the ligaments. You've got four primary ligaments, uh, which I just listed out there for you and just in the acronyms your ACL, PCL, and then your MCL and LCL. So ACL, PCL are inside the knee itself. So between the femur and the tibia, you would see them kind of crisscross in there, kind of like that. Whereas your LCL and your MCL are on the outside of the knee, outside the joint, and they're going like here and here. So that's what gives your knee some extra support and stability um, is those ligaments. The LCL and MCL are basically keeping your knee from buckling in or bowing out. So that's side to side stability. And then the ACL and PCL, which are inside the knee, those have a, a little different function. Um, it helps protect with twisting and torsion of the knee and then it helps with the knee sliding forward or backwards. Has anyone ever had an ACL injury? Okay. But what you'll find then is with an ACL injury is that 
you could take the tibia, the shin bone, and essentially you could slide it forward now, which isn't a good thing. Like it shears. So that's, it's really strange. I mean, we're local folks. Everyone's familiar with Adam Morrison, right? So he tore his ACL first year of, of pro basketball. Little tiny ligament, probably as big as your pinky. And for like an athlete, it'll keep him out of sports for roughly a year. Now, if Adam Morrison had just fractured his femur and got it over with, he probably would have been running around in about six weeks. So it's pretty interesting when you come down to these little soft tissue structures. Another good example of a little soft tissue structure causing a lot of trouble would be like a bulging disc in your lower back. It's not very big, and the nerve it's touching is pretty small, but it can cause a world of hurt. Um, so again, just to know the structures of the knee, just for basic anatomy, um, obviously as therapists, we should know all these structures and we should know how to test for them and, and see if there's any involvement in them. Um, and then last bullet point, um, underneath why knee pain is so common because of all these structures, you've got meniscus in the middle of the joint, which Harold, you mentioned earlier. Those are the little ring-like gasket things in between, um, in between the, the femur and the tibia, so inside the knee again. Uh, several smaller ligaments that have all these fancy names that we won't get into. And then, uh, anyone ever heard of the IT band before? IT band? Okay. Yeah, so IT band is that long soft tissue band that runs along the outside. Um, again, pain out there is common in runners, it's common in cyclists, it's common in walkers, and then it's common in people who have issues with their hips and their core. How are we doing, Serena? Any questions on there? Uh, no, we had a few people responding. Okay. Oh, don't even worry. Just keep it on yours. Yeah, okay. you're fine. Oh, just see if anything pops right? up. Yeah, if you're at home and you have questions, just write it down and Serena will tell me at some point. Right. She'll wave at me or throw a marker at me or something. We are in uncharted territory here. So, okay. Any questions on the anatomy of the knee? Does that kind of help explain why knee problems are so common? Another reason, obviously, is that the knee is kind of in the middle of your leg. So anything you do with impact is going to go through your knee, repetitive walking, stairs, squats. Um, things like meniscus injuries and MCL injuries are really pretty common. Um, and as we know, we have at least one person with a meniscus injury. So, okay. Um, and by the way, I do have all of your specific questions with me. So I'll either address those from your sheets later, or if you want to shout them out as we go along, if it makes sense, then go right ahead. So um, several other factors can attribute to or affect pain in the knee. So I want to cover those as well to give you a bigger bird's eye view. So that first bullet point we have there is your ankle stability and your arch support. So that word on the blank there is arch. Now if you look at the, the ankle, can anyone imagine why in, like a poor arch support might impact your knee if you were to look at it. Yeah, it's an alignment thing. And the arch essentially is a shock absorber. So the arch in your foot. I'm not going to take off my shoes because, you know, we don't want to go there. But I do have some nice socks on today though. Um, but so your arch support, let's say your arch support's about should be like that. Now once in a while people have high arches, right? Not nearly as common. Low arches is mainly what we talk about with people. Um, so a lower arch means you have less arch support, less shock absorption going through your foot, which means more of the shock is going to translate up the chain from the ground up, so up through your knee, up through your hip, up through your spine. Um, and the other thing with a lower arch is that, mechanically speaking, if this is a normal arch and then my arch flattens, my knees are going to go in more. Go ahead. R2? Yeah. We'll get to that later, R2. Okay. <laughs> Stretch the IT band. Okay. Thanks for the question. Um, R2 works here, by the way. <laughs> okay. So, um, and we will talk about that, especially if people want to talk about IT band later with, with treatment techniques and stuff. Um, so the arch, again, if it's low, your, your feet are going to collapse inwards, and then your knee is going to collapse inwards. So you can imagine what that does. If you take my nice little picture here, which I don't even know if they can see online, maybe. Oh, that isn't going to help, is it? Now you guys can't see it. Um, so let's just say this knee, would you guys agree this knee is pretty well straight up and down? It's pretty lined up. Now again, this is a right knee facing forward towards you. If the arch was flattened on the inside, the knee is going to buckle this way, correct? 
Hard to envision, I know. If I could draw better, I would. Um, but the knee's gonna buckle this way. And so essentially, this, part, this joint, this outside joint of the knee is gonna be compressed. And then this inside ligament is gonna be stressed or pulled on. That kind of makes sense. So on my knee here, right knee, if it goes in, the outside compartment of my knee is now compressed. The inside is spaced, but when you space the inside of the knee, you're also stretching that MCL ligament on the inside. So the point I try to make with the arch support and the ankle is that just because you have a knee issue doesn't mean it's just a knee issue. It could also be a mechanical issue. It could be a ground up issue. It could be that your arches are so flat. Uh, if you dig deep with someone with knee pain, do they have foot pain? Do they have plantar fasciitis? Do they have previous foot surgeries, fusions? Um, oh, what's the word with it? Bunionectomy, stuff like that. If those things are lingering in your history, you could say, well, your knee pain is caused by you have an MCL strain in your knee, and we're going to treat your MCL strain. But if we never fix the underlying cause of that foot, then we're not going to get too far, or at least for not for too long. So that's the importance of looking at the joint below. Um, the next bullet there is the joint above. And so commonly what you'll see with knee problems, especially in females, is that you have a hip or a core weakness. So hip strength and alignment. Now as a female, you were blessed with a wider pelvis than us men, right? There's a purpose for that. Because you're supposed to, you're gonna bear children at some point. So if you take me, I'm pretty narrow, I'm pretty narrow waisted. My knee just lines up straight with my hip. My femur pretty much goes straight down. My tibia is pretty much straight underneath there. But what if you gave me my wife's pelvis and it's a couple inches wider? Now for my, for my um, femurs here to get back underneath my body, now they're essentially angled in. So you have this what we call a Q angle at your knee. And so for a guy, a Q angle is normally between like zero and five degrees, but for a female, it's not uncommon to be between like 10 and 15 just the way things are. Uh, naturally speaking, when you look at strength, um, hip strength, I didn't put knee strength on there, although hopefully that's an obvious one. Um, you look at strength, and again, across the board, you're gonna see knee pain more commonly in females because of the strength issue too. You know, a little bit of hip weakness, a little bit of quad weakness. So those are all things to consider. Again, not just the knee itself. Um, does that make sense to everyone so far, the hips? Has anyone had therapy for their knee and they end up doing hip strengthening exercises? Not so much. Okay, it's usually a big part of your therapy. Um, again, mechanically speaking, too, if you took a, take my right hip, and most commonly what we see with hip weakness is you see hip weakness of these muscles on the outside of the hip, which we call your abductors, because they essentially lift your leg to the side, and then your external rotators, which are back deep in your buttocks. Now, if those two muscle groups get weak, which they are for a lot of people, what will happen essentially is the femur then will drift towards midline as well. Kind of the same thing that was caused by, the, by a flat arch. So your knee drifts inwards. Another thing to point out is, you see my kneecap through my pants there. If my knee drifts inwards, like it rotates that way, what do you think that does to my kneecap? Yeah, essentially now, my kneecap, instead of riding in the middle of the groove when it bends and straightens, is now riding in the outside of the groove because it wants to be pulled back to where it started in the midline. So you see a lot of problems with kneecaps, um, alignment, and you look, at the, you look from the ground up, you look from the top down. And like R2 mentioned, you look at things like IT band issues then too because if that's tight, it's going to pull your kneecap out. I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here. Um, but those are, again, mechanically, these are all things to consider. And so when you get someone who's had knee pain for a long time and they feel like they're just stuck with it and maybe they did PT with it already, you really have to ask yourself, well, what did you do and how deep did you really dig? Um, because again, when I was a PT, let's say in my younger years, um, so I've been a PT for 13 years, if you gave me someone with MCL pain, I treated the MCL. That's about all I did. And maybe I was a bad therapist back then or maybe I was just excited because I figured out what was causing the person's knee pain. And I treated the MCL and it went well and then they were, they were out of there. But what would happen then is if I didn't actually dig deeper and look at the hip and look at the ankle quite as well, um, is that the, knee, the, the progress I made with that person would have been short-lived because the underlying cause wasn't quite fixed. So again, when you're looking at your knee, don't forget your ankle, don't forget your hip. Um, the last bullet point I have there 
is other ongoing issues with pain. So that last blank there is just the word pain. Um, you never want to overlook the person with knee pain who also has SI joint pain, lumbar pain, sciatic pain, uh, which again, back in my younger days, if you were referred to me for knee pain by your doctor, I treated your knee pain. Nowadays, if you're referred to me for knee pain, I'm asking you, how's your ankle? How's your hip? Do you have SI joint pain in your back? Or what I would consider SI joint pain. You don't have to know what kind of pain you have when you come in here. We'll figure it out for you. But do you have pain in your buttocks? Do you have sciatic pain? Because guess what? All these things go together. They all go together. So important points to make, especially if you're trying to get help with uh, your problem. Any good questions so far on what we're covering? Am I making any sense? Kinda? Chris, are you still with me? Yeah? Okay. So far, so far? All right. So the most common type of pain we see in the clinic, people coming off the street with knee pain, is what we call patellofemoral joint pain. You want me to spell that out? Patello. Patello dash femoral or femoral, depending on what part of the country you're from. <laughs> Patello femoral pain, joint pain. Now this is typically your person who has pain along the front of their knee, right around their kneecap, and a lot of times it feels like it's underneath the kneecap or deep, or deep to the kneecap. Anyone here have that? Okay. Have you had that too, Harold, or more inside, deeper inside? Yeah. Chris? Yeah. Yeah. So you bring up a good point. I'm just going to jump around here just a tiny bit. So you said a little pain here, but also pain there. Now, in a really perfect world, maybe how I viewed the world 13 years ago, if you came with, to me with knee pain, you had one thing. One thing, right? It was either the MCL, or it was patellofemoral joint, or it was hamstring or IT band. In the real world, most of our clients have more than one thing. That's just not fair, right? So it could be a little bit of MCL, could be a patellofemoral tracking issue, compounded by IT band, compounded by weak quads, compounded by poor hip strength, compounded by hip pain, compounded by a flat foot, right? What a nightmare. But that's how it works sometimes. And you know how one thing tends to feed another thing too, right? That's one of life's little tricks too. Um, so tangent, I love my tangents. I love my soapboxes. Trying to get up on one today. Um, but patellofemoral joint pain is super common. Um, and basically I've described it there for you on the worksheet. Is that poor tracking of the kneecap leads to pain near the front of the knee. Like I just described. Typically it's associated with weakness in the quad and hip muscles, quad and hip. R2 says the hip bone is connected to the knee bone. He's doing great. Thank you, R2. I love the encouragement. We should do this more often so R2 can just chime in and, and uh, keep, keep me going. Thank you. Hip bone, knee bone, we're going to dance later. It's going to be great. <laughs> so, Patellofemoral tracking, we've, I've kind of already explained it uh, a little bit, but again, your kneecap would like to live in the middle of its groove. Um, stay in your groove, right? Stay in your lane in life. Don't get out of your lane. Uh, so your kneecap would like to stay in its lane, in the middle of its groove. Uh, and basically, as I'm bending my knee and straightening my knee, the kneecap is moving up and down in the middle of that groove. Um, with a patellofemoral joint issue, usually what's happened is it's starting to track to the outside of the groove. So instead of having a nice smooth joint surface that it's tracking on to spread out the weight, spread out the force, it's, uh, it's more tracking on one side than the other. And that hurts after a while. So again, you look at it mechanically. Is it a mechanical issue where the knee has just kind of been rotated in? Which if you, if you ever look at your friends walk around, you'll spot the ones who are like that. Because you look at them and it's like their knee is going like this. Especially if you look at them walk from behind, which has a PT and... R2 as a PTA, like, that's just what we do, I think. Um, a lot of fun going to like Disneyland or Silverwood because there's so many folks walking around and I'm just diagnosing them left and right. Um, 
I don't usually say it to my wife because I think it would drive her crazy. But if you ever just walk your, watch your friends, you'll see the ones where the knees are just bowing in. Okay, so again, uh, mechanically speaking, your kneecap, your patella, is being pulled towards the outside of your joint. And over time, that's causing pain. Um, one of the common causes, like I have on there, is quad weakness, especially this chunk of quad muscle along the inside of your thigh. Anyone ever heard of this little chunk of quad? Anyone besides R2? Your VMO, they call it. So this VMO, I won't even tell you the, the fancy name. I do know it, but I won't tell it to you. Um, basically, the, those quad fibers are aligned in this diagonal direction. So if you have a real strong quad there, when you squeeze your quad, it tends to keep that knee uh, tracking in good alignment. So quad weakness is going to be a big reason for that patellofemoral pain. And then hip weakness is super common with knee pain. Just in general, you know, I make YouTube videos and stuff like that. I can give generic advice all day long, and it might do people some good because if you just play it by the numbers, the average person with a knee issue has weak quads and they have weak hip muscles. So again, we see that with the abductors and the rotators here. And if those muscles are weak, again, it changes the alignment of the knee and causes the front of the knee to be out of alignment. Does that make pretty good sense? Yeah? You guys ready for the test at the end? Okay, the anatomy test. What does VMO stand for? You never told us. Yeah. I wonder if R2 put it on there and see if he knows. He doesn't know. You don't even know R2. He's looking it up. All right, cool. Um, let's see, let's see. Okay, questions so far before we do number four. Yeah. about alignment, mine had deteriorated in the latter stages before my surgeries. Uh, I was bow-legged on both knees, yeah. and so they were collapsing outwards. Mm -hmm. But uh, in addition to that, the tibia on each leg was moved roughly one inch outboard in its alignment. Mm. So my legs were both, my knees were both Z-shaped. Oh, wow. One inch sideways on the right, three quarters of an inch sideways. Yeah. Left, compared to a straight line. Yeah. Did they straighten you out with the knee replacements or pretty close? Yeah. No. Good. Good, good. But it, uh, certainly an inconvenience. Yeah. Okay, laundry list. Number four is the laundry list. Oh, go ahead, Joy. Okay, so when you straighten the knee, sometimes the knee joint pops. Is that because it's not tracking correctly? Potentially, yes. Potentially, yes. Um, when it comes to like popping and crackling, it could be a tracking issue. Um, it could just be a little bit of extra inflammation in the joint that's causing things to run into each other. Um, d does it cause pain or is it just noisy? Just noisy, yeah. So it could be, it could be either of those things. Yeah. Um, when you talk about like popping and clicking, I just heard that, yeah. Or if that got caught up on the on the video there, yeah, um, it's not necessarily cause for concern because some amount of noise in your body I think is just normal. You know, I mean, I can pop my knees most of the time, and I don't attempt to do it unless I feel like it needs to be done. It doesn't always mean there's a problem, um, but it is worth looking into. Um, if you have a painful pop or more like a catching sensation or a lock, we tend to think more of a meniscus issue. So those ones definitely, if it's a painful pop, I say, okay, you want to get that checked out uh, just because, yeah, a lot of people have noisy joints and I, I don't typically get too worried about it. Um, that being said though, with treatment, if you're treating your knee anyways because it hurts, a lot of times if we can decrease the inflammation and improve the alignment, a lot of the noise will go away. So I guess now that I'm talking in circles, it, it may be something to look into, you know? May or may not sound like a politician now, don't I? Could be that, could not be that. What do you think? Why don't you ask me another question? Okay, so number four is a laundry list. Other common causes, and we probably touch on a few of these ligament sprains I've mentioned. Uh, that blank there is MCL. MCL is the most common ligament sprain. That's that one again, right along the inside of your knee. Um, if you think you have an MCL uh, issue, if you go right along the joint line where it gets kind of firm there and you push on it and you can kind of feel between the two bones, that's your MCL right there. So usually like as a therapist, it's pretty easy to check for if I can put my fingers on it and it hurts uh, inside of the knee there, Joy. There you go. Um, typically it's MCL, although it could be meniscus too, so you do have to check for those things. 
Um, but that's a common ligament sprain that we check for. Uh, other things on your list there, muscle strains. Uh, more commonly muscle strains you would see in a hamstring. We don't get a lot of quad strains just because it's such a big muscle, although you do get quad tendon issues once in a while. Does anyone know someone who ever tore their quad tendon? Yeah, it happens once in a while. Um, it's really nasty. It happens. Uh, not that common. You'll see it in sports sometimes. Um, I actually saw a guy do it once when we were playing basketball and he, he came down and he could jump really high. Not like, not like me and Maria, if she's watching, she thinks she can jump high. But um, he came down and that, that, that slow, we call it an eccentric load, when you're slowly lowering and the muscle is contracting and it just pops. So that can happen. Uh, those obviously go straight to surgery. It would never be in PT. I mean, a lesser version of that would be that the tendon just hurts a lot above your kneecap. That can happen. I mean, you get other muscular issues, sometimes down uh, lower on the inside of the tibia there. Um, meniscus tears we mentioned. IT band irritation we mentioned. Got a question? Yeah, it says, how can we strengthen the posterior chain muscles, the hips you talked about? Um, well, the posterior chain muscles, the hips you talked about. That's R2 again. I know. <laughs> posterior chain muscle is the hips you talk. Okay, hip strengthening. Do you guys want to hear about hip strengthening a little bit later when we talk about treatment options? Okay, cool. We'll get to it then. Sorry, just making sure you're aware. Thank you. I can see him popping up actually, yeah, but thank you. Um, that, that big blank there, you guys are probably all familiar with this one. Uh, arthritis. Has anyone heard of arthritis before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question for you guys too. How many folks here have had an x-ray of their knee? Of your, well, yeah, or anything, yeah. 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 So they usually describe arthritis in your x-ray. Um, if you were to see your knee on an x-ray and you had arthritis in your knee, they would talk about the inside compartment, which they call medial, outside compartment they call lateral. And what you would see, um, like Owen was real bow-legged, you said, so your inside compartment was probably bone on bone. So instead of this nice little space between the two bones, that space represents your cartilage. Your cartilage doesn't get picked up on an x-ray. It's, it, it's just seen through. Um, so that space would be squished. You would see this bone sitting right on top of that bone. If you guys, th those of you with a total knee replacement, did you actually see your x-ray before surgery? Did the surgeon show you a picture? Yeah. It's pretty obvious when you see it, right? I go, that's what bone on bone looks like. Yeah, it's not... It's not this, it's this. And it's just sitting there. Yeah. So arthritis, uh, definitely a common one. Opens up a can of worms with arthritis. And you say, well, okay, I, you have arthritis. Uh, what you really want to know, is the arthritis causing your pain? And is there anything you can do about it to improve the pain? What do you guys think about, this is a common question we get, can you fix arthritis? Can you cure arthritis? Can you fix it? Can you reverse it? Do you guys ever wonder about that? Yeah. What do you think, Harold? Can you fix arthritis? Can you reverse the hands of time? As far as we know, no. You know, over the years, you've heard about supplements like glucosamine, chondroitin. Some people say they work. I've never seen a real solid study that shows it regrows cartilage. Um, certainly, there may be some anti-inflammatory effects of over-the-counter supplements, things like that. But in terms of structurally, we're never really looking to reverse arthritis, but there is a chance you can alleviate the pain associated with the arthritis. So that's the caveat. Um, the other interesting thing too is you'll get people with bone-on-bone -bone arthritis that don't really have any pain. What's the deal there? It's not completely objective. You couldn't just give me 20 x-rays and I could tell you who has pain and who doesn't. Because again, it's not always the arthritis that's causing the pain. It could be any of these other things. It could be the fact that their knee is always tracking poorly, and that's causing inflammation. So you just have to be aware of that. Just because you, arthritis isn't like a death sentence, I guess is what I'm saying. It's not like, hey, you, and you hear it a lot. Well, you have arthritis, nothing you can do about it. Okay, go home and don't do anything about it. You know, it's like, well, you could feel better, though. And if you could feel better, you could do more. So the semantics are super important. It's like, arthritis, nothing you can do about it. It's one of my favorite soapboxes. I won't go too far. But true, can't do anything about it. But could you feel better? If you felt better, could you stand up out of a chair without your knees hurting? If you felt better, could you go up and down the stairs? It's like, yes. And obviously, I can't guarantee anyone's going to feel better, but 
it's worth a try, especially if it helps you avoid a knife. A sharp knife in a sterile room, right? <laughs> it's a good email subject line. A sharp knife in a sterile room. Okay. Okay, and then um, other types of knee pain. These are your more obvious ones. Fractures, trauma, surgery. Um, yeah, that hurts. <laughs> I read one of your articles, and you used uh, a treatment on it, to some kind of injection. I've had the injections, protostone, and then you know, the first time I had them, they were uh -huh. pretty good. Second time I had them, I could tell it wasn't good. And the third time, it lasted two days. But you yeah. had something in there, I wonder if you get some kind of a... I'm sure it was your article, or it might have been another article I read. Yeah. But they put some kind of injection in there. Uh, I should have kept the one that I read it on. It was, I'm pretty sure it was you. Let me know if you find it, because we don't do injections. Okay, and I got another question. Yeah. I know you don't do a laser either. No, I don't do laser. Have you ever heard of it? You ever know of anybody here? Laser. Oh, yeah, laser, from what I know, works. Now, I, had, I read an article on the Pateka. Mayo Clinic, and they say there's, there's a laser treatment if you try to get a doctor that is experienced with it. Uh huh. And they say that there's a lot of results on laser treatment. Yeah, people do get pretty good results with laser. But uh, see, now my problem, the other question I well, I've got to make to interrupt your no, go ahead. seminar here. It just needs really bad here. It goes out from under me a lot of times. It buckles. Yeah. Yeah, not true. I have pain for one reason. Yeah. But then when I, if I would walk from here down there to your back door and back, I have to have this cane because I'm walking, I'll be walking like this. Yeah. And my back is what's killing me now. Yes. I, I was going to ask you about the hips. I read about that too. Yeah. And uh, I have both hips are bad hips i got a sore place on each one of them. Right around the bone? Well, probably on the bone. I, 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 got a whole, I got a whole history I can tell you, but I'm not going to tell you that. But, yeah. But uh, I was wondering if you could add injury in your hips, like in, right in this area here. Mm hmm But that would cause your pain, pain to be worse, and your back, my back is what kills me now. Yeah. I can't even walk hardly a half a block and I'm out of trouble. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd say it's from the pain. Yeah. But I might be wrong. So. But I can take pain pills, but I don't like to take pain pills. Yeah. First thing you know, I'm booked on. Yeah. And I don't like it. Yeah. I don't and blame that's you. That's the reason I come over here tonight to your seminar. Yeah. Because uh, I just wanted to see what you. But you don't do neither one of them, so that would be. But I'll answer your questions, though, because you bring up really good points. So you say the knee pain is bad enough that it. It requires you to walk with a cane. So it throws off the way you move and walk, right? Mm -hmm. um, now you've got problems in both hips, mm -hmm. kind of along the sides, maybe into the buttocks a little bit as well. Like you're in the foot area. Kind of in the buttocks. Um, a lot of times you'll get pain along the side of the hips. Chances are, right. chances are if I pushed on you, I'd find a couple of spots to make you jump. So you've got that, and now your back hurts too. Which anyone here, hip or back pain as well, or just knee? Hip and back, yeah. So that was in, you know, under number two, ongoing issues with pain. I kind of breezed over that a little bit, I think. But knee pain is often associated with hip and back pain because, again, when you take something like knee pain, and was the, do you think the knee pain was the start of all this? Yeah. Was, was the knee pain the chicken or the egg? <laughs> yeah. I've had, this, I've had this pain for quite a while. Yeah. But it's got worse than I had. I was in the hospital for about six months. Yeah. I got out of there, and things just went to hell. Yeah. So I can't hardly. I, I don't have any breath anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a, yeah. Something around my neck when it starts hurting. I can feel that's hurting. Yeah. And my leg starts hurting, and then it across my lower back and up, up about halfway up my back. Yeah. And I gotta get some way or other. I gotta get rid of that. In my back because I can't do yeah. So I mentioned the chicken or the egg. So let's just play this out a little bit, if you don't mind. Let's just kind of go through what what possibly happened. So possibly 
it started as a knee issue, just for argument's sake. So it started as a knee issue. As the knee issue got worse, you couldn't walk as much, you couldn't do as much, you couldn't get around as much. So the knee, by default now, is getting weaker. It's getting weaker all the time. You're relying on the cane a little bit. So the leg is getting weaker. Maybe your right leg gets a little bit stronger for a given period because it's doing more work. But over time, as you do less and less, the knees get weaker, the hips get weaker. Now the hips hurt because muscle weakness in the hips will cause a lot of pain over time because you end up with things like bursitis. So bursitis, when you push on these bones around here and you find the muscle tendons and they're just screaming at you. The reason they're so angry is because they're weak. And now you try to do activity and they get stressed and they just get inflamed. More than likely, if I pushed along here, I'd find that your IT band hurts too. So we'd find all these muscles now that are really irritated with you. And now, whether or not you had a back problem before, now your back hurts too. Because you're not walking normally. You've got problems with weakness surrounding your knees and your hips. And now you've got core weakness too. And you're not doing enough movement really to keep your back lubricated and stretched out. Now, unless you're doing things proactively to decrease your back pain, like, you know, like a yoga routine or some stretches, things just, especially for guys, things just get tighter and tighter and tighter. Meanwhile, everything's getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And now the whole chicken or the egg question is pretty well irrelevant because now everything has a life of its own. So early on, if you just had a knee problem and you had a little bit of hip pain, but nothing too severe like you have now, if we just fixed your knee, everything else may have gone away because we fixed the underlying problem. Now if we fixed your knee and you felt pretty good, more than likely your hip and your back pain wouldn't just go away. You'd have to, you'd have to focus on those too. So at this point, I think it's fair to say they're all connected. You wouldn't just want to work on your back or just your hip or just your knee. You would want to work on all three together because they're all part of your system. They're all part of the way you move. And more than likely, if you can get all three of them functioning better, get the pain level down, re-strengthen, improve flexibility if you need to, then everything would, would improve together. Yeah, see, I, I agree with what you're saying on the hip. I think that the knee, I know, is weak. But I went through everything I went through. My hips, and it starts when my back started to hurt. Yeah. Because it's... To me, what I'm getting at is it's, it's not strong enough to support my back because I'll be yeah. I'll walk straight for a little bit. First thing you know, I'm going like this. Yeah. Over and over and more. And I have to make myself yeah. stay back like that. Yep. And now it's getting, it's probably arthritis, but I have to keep back like this because it's starting to come up in the world. Yeah. My shoulder area up there on my neck. Yep. Then you start thinking, where do you start? You know, yeah, do you start with the back? Do you start with some free knee exercises? Where, well, what do you see, do? I'll, I'll tell you, I've been taking some physical therapy. Yeah. It's performance. I don't know if you know who they are. Uh-huh, yeah. I like a real good guy. Yeah. But they went, it's called the stars, were having all these problems. Yeah. So they quit going over because they weren't operating and everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I had one, uh, one guy I had for he was really, really good. He went to Port Lane and John, I don't know. Mm. Got muscles on him like this. Big muscles? Yeah. yeah I know the type. <laughs> you see, is he right here? He that's our like that's our two. But yeah. He, was, he really he really knew his best. Yeah. And he had worked on a, he used to work on football players and basketball players and everything like that. He got yeah. started because they were so it's only if I'm worth millions of dollars, <laughs> you better treat me right. Yeah. And you get probably like part of that, and then you come, I don't know why you work, but I say he's about 40 years old. Yeah. But he really did a lot for me. Yeah. I mean, he, and another thing I'll tell you, this might let me give you another hint. This leg over here is about a half inch shorter uh -huh. than this leg over here. Yeah. And I wear a, I probably went and got a... I noticed that with your shoe. Yeah, you've got a, a built-up shoe there. Yeah, I yeah. got a, a support to put it in there. Yeah. And that helps a lot, but if I don't wear it all the time, it just goes away again. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you were on the right track. The only thing that slowed you down was you stopped but I may ask you treatment what, or didn't I have the right... I didn't interrupt you here and, and take your time, but I'm trying to decide whether I've been told by two or three different people and a couple of them were medical. They said I should have an eight transplants. 
replacement. Yeah, replacement. But I say, wait a minute now. There's always two, three stories to everything. Yeah. There has to be something in between. My brother-in-law's had two knee replacements. Mm -hmm. And he's as happy as a lark. My sister's had one. And she's pretty happy. Yeah. I mean, they live back in Kentucky, not out here. Uh-huh. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not so sure that a, I mean, a knee replacement would be a cure. Yeah. Gene, if you don't mind, can we talk more after? I'll talk to you one-on-one -on -one a little bit. Sounds good. Like I said, I want to yeah. I no, no. I think you're probably asking questions that other people are thinking, too. You know, when do you determine if a knee replacement is, is what you need or not? And, and the general answer to that, by the way, if you guys are thinking the same thing, like, how do you know if you need a total knee replacement? And um, the way I think of it is, well, did you do everything you could to avoid it? Just like any other type of surgery. You know, did you improve your strength as much as you could? Did you try to treat... Uh, all the things that are surrounding your knee. And from what you've told me, you're not at the point where I would feel comfortable making that decision yet. Because you were making some gains with PT, you were doing some good things, and until you really know how far that's going to get you, I would hold off on the decision making until you really know how good you could feel with just a good PT, working you with strength, working you with soft tissue, all those things. That would be my default. Um, and I mean, ultimately, some people need a total knee. It just is what it is. You know, you keep as strong as you can, you keep as active as you can, you do all those good things, but then your activity level at some point starts to plateau and then it starts to decline and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Then you're thinking more along the lines of if surgery is right. So, hold out. Okay, any other questions before I cruise along to number five? Get going here? Okay, um, and you already kind of let into this gene. The biggest mistake people make when they're suffering from knee pain, the first thing they do is they... Anybody? Ignore. Hey, Serena gets to the gold. They ignore it. Yeah. So the biggest mistake you see with people with knee pain, and this is any type of pain, um, we ignore it for as long as we can. And sometimes if you ignore it for too long, it gets to be worse than it needed to be. So the first thing you do is ignore it. And actually, the, the way Gene led into it was the second thing they do is they don't ignore it. They mask it. They cover it up. So they either ignore it or they mask it with a painkiller um, you know, you might be okay with ibuprofen and Aleve for a short period of time, but your system was not designed to ingest that stuff for very long, if at all. That's an arguing point we could talk about later uh, in natural health. But if you're ultimately, if you're needing medications to get through the day, you're covering the pain when you should be looking the other direction for what can you do to eliminate it. Go ahead, Owen. With me not knowing any better, for nearly three years prior to surgery, they would have the industrial grade ibuprofen, and it didn't help that much. Yeah. And late in the treatment, I found out that I was suffering frequent nosebleeds because ibuprofen is a blood thinner. Yeah. Thank you very much for telling me this. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's the, the other biggest mistake is mask it. What should you do with knee pain? If you can, you should fix it. Now, I know that sounds really simple. But that's why I went through all these confusing details. It's not that easy to fix it. If it was easy to fix it, you would have done it by now. Um, the YouTube video that you looked up would have done the trick. No one's guilty of that, right? Google and YouTube. It's kind of funny. I, I, had a, I finally made this video the other day on YouTube about why free exercises don't work. And I loved making it because I give out free exercises all the time. And I'm saying there's a reason why you know, free exercises don't work. Because I can give you free exercises, but I have never helped you figure it out what's the causing your pain. Like I can tell you that this will probably help, probably, maybe, 10%, 20%. But if you're looking for a complete resolution of your pain or you're looking for a specific goal, I can't do that with a free exercise. And so the point I made in the video too though is sometimes it's a good place to start with people. Because by me giving you some free exercises, sometimes that just helps you build a little trust in me to know that I'm not like a slime ball or a snake oil salesman. So there is a purpose and there is a value with free exercises. Um, but if you've ever been felt left down by the free exercises you got off YouTube, that's why. Um, because on your own, this stuff is fairly confusing to decipher. So now that I've led you off topic here, um, we'll get through the next couple bullet points here. How do we successfully treat knee pain? Just in generalities, again, step one is we're going to determine the root cause. 
If you've read my newspaper articles, which I think most of you had, it's a common theme, right? You've got to know the root cause. We've talked about what is the cause of it in the knee itself, but is there another issue with the foot? Is there another issue with the hip or the back? Like you really have to figure out, like we're, human beings are like whole systems. You get that term homeopathic medicine, that's what it's, or holistic, that's what they're implying, is that you have to improve the whole system. So again, the root cause could be beyond just the knee itself. So that's step one. After we've figured that out, we're going to design a PT program catered to your specific needs. So figure out the root cause. Like I mentioned earlier, it could be more than one root cause. Good, good. Just checking the, checking the screen here. You just want to know all that because then you can figure out, is there even a point in trying? Do I need surgery? Maybe the root cause is that you can't, you can't do anything about it. You need surgery. It's just good to know what you're dealing with before you try to improve it. So piggybacking off of step two, if you're going into PT with one of us here at Gordon PT, this is what we do. Have you guys heard me ramble on about the three phases of healing in the newspaper too? I say ramble affectionately because I like to ramble. Yeah. All right. Oh, I have the poster, don't I? Oh, I should grab. Yeah, you want to grab me the poster? You guys have never seen it in visual format before, and it is inspiring. Why do I never think to grab this? There it is for the folks at home, the three phases. So knee pain, back pain, shoulder pain, same general concept. The first thing you want to do with uh, getting someone to feel better so they can be more active, more mobile, all those good things, is you want pain reduction. Phase one, pain reduction. Get the pain level down. Do what you got to do. For us, that a lot of times that involves hands-on therapy. If your knee is really hurting and you have an IT band issue, we've got to put our hands on you. Do things that you can't do for yourself. R2 asked about stretching the IT band. I probably won't actually demonstrate the stretch unless anyone really wants me to. But yeah, stuff like that. You need to get the soft tissue uh, going again. If you've got a little hip bursitis, it's going to respond really well if you can make it feel better. Because before you get to phase two, you've got to make the tissue feel better. Phase two then involves uh, improving strength and flexibility. Mostly strength for the most part. Some flexibility, flexibility helps, um, but for a lot of people it's, an, it's a strength issue. Um, so if you look at my little diagram here, the red zone is phase one, getting rid of the pain and inflammation. Then as you're making gains there, you can go into phase two. Now you're working on strength and flexibility. What do you guys think would happen if instead of doing phase one, you just jump straight to phase two? We said, Joy, one of the problems with your knee is you've got weakness in your quads and you've got weakness in your hip muscles here and your core. So what we're going to do is we're going to make you stronger and that will lead to pain improvement, right? But we skipped pain reduction. What do you think might happen, usually happens? Probably quit. That's a good point. Probably quit because why? Because it hurts. What if you take an irritated muscle and you try to strengthen it? It hurts. It hurts. Oh my goodness. Rocket science. Yeah, it hurts. My goodness. So the most common reason you'll see people drop out of PT is because I went to my PT and I had knee pain and I had a sore hip and he gave me these five exercises and told me to do them once a day, twice a day, whatever. I went back, let's say Thursday, I went back on Monday and I told him I hurt even worse. So he said, okay, let's do those exercises again. And then, okay, I gave him another try on next Thursday. And he did the same thing. And guess what? I keep feeling worse. And the reason I came is to feel better. And it's taken time out of my day and maybe some money out of my pocket, depending on what your copay situation is. I find people are more attached to their time than their money, just as an aside. Um, it's not always a money issue. But certainly, if you are spending money, you expect some kind of a result. So you say, well, why do I keep going back to this guy when he keeps hurting me? Well, yeah. Why is he hurting you? Because he didn't do any pain reduction. Now, big picture. Does strengthening those muscles make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's really hard to strengthen a muscle if it hurts. It's going to be really hard for me to give Gene uh, sideline clamshells, which are great exercises, sideline hip abduction, which is a great exercise for strengthening, because more than likely when he does it a few times at home, he's going to hurt. And then he's got to take an entire week off, by which time no gains in strength, and then he's discouraged. And then <sighs> Gene says, I tried PT and it didn't work. Yeah. I got articles all about that, right? I tried PT and it didn't work. Actually, I just, I do that one like once a year maybe. It needs to come out again because we hear it a lot. So, okay. 
Then we're going to get to phase three, right? We made you feel better. We did hands-on therapy. Maybe we did some taping, some cool stuff. Us therapists have cool tricks to tell you what. We made you feel better. Now we're strengthening you. You're feeling pretty good. Now we can just make sure that all those specific activities, all the gains we've made in pain reduction and strength are translating into what you actually came to us for. Joy for you, you said you want to be able to get up and down from a chair without pain. Okay, great. Did we give you enough strength to accomplish that? Perfect. Stairs, whatever it may be. Hiking, um, whether it maybe you're still skiing. Okay, we, we did all these things well. Can you actually do what you want to do? And part of this phase three is do you feel like you're in a spot where you can maintain those gains that you've made? So. Those are the three phases. Does that all sound pretty reasonable? Is good with that? Okay. I'm going to grab those sheets real quick. If you have a specific question that I missed, please shout it out. Go ahead, Joy. Doing like that? Yeah. Okay, so you're you're feeling a stretch back here on the back of your buttocks probably? There, yeah. 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 So that's more of a buttocks stretch, piriformis stretch. That's one of those hip rotator muscles that I've been kind of been referring to. Yeah. Um, you mentioned IT though. Yeah, and, and the IT band, you, IT, yeah, you kind of feel it down there. It's not quite your IT band. The IT band you would feel more down here. Um, IT band stretches, since R2 asked, it's more of an awkward one where you cross one leg over and then shift your hip out. And actually, the funny thing about the IT band stretch is you're, you're not really stretching your IT band, you're stretching the little muscle that attaches to it. So you actually feel it up here. Most of where I think the, the progress comes with the IT band is the massage techniques. You know, and there's some you can do on your own. We've got all manner of fun massage rollers these days because I love buying stuff on Amazon. So we have like all these different types and some are spiky and some are smooth and all these different things. Um, if you're a little more extreme and you can tolerate it, you got like foam roller massaging, which for a lot of people is a little too aggressive. Um, unless they're really small, you know, kind of a thing, but putting all your weight on a foam roller. Um, so yeah, so you're, you're doing more of a stretch than for those buttock muscles. Yeah. Yep. yep. And again, IT band, we're not, it's not something you strengthen. You're just trying to stretch it out and improve the healing. Yeah, it's very fibrous and tough. It's really tough. It's actually really debatable if you can actually stretch the band at all. Most PTs don't think you can stretch it at all. You can just make it feel better. You can break up scar tissue. You can reduce inflammation. Combine that with some improvements in your mechanics and you can keep it happy. Yeah. Does that make sense? Any other specific ones you had, Joy? Pretty good. Harold, did I cover most of your questions? Pretty well? Okay. Good, good. Oh, I, f I forgot about that. So, yeah, one of our clients yesterday asked about this. It's called like a leg exerciser, wasn't it? Leg exercise. It's one of these, as seen on TV type machines, where you sit and you put your feet on a platform <clears throat> and the platform just moves back and forth like that. It's like a split platform. And then maybe there was a fancier one that kind of did more of an elliptical movement, although the one you were showing me was an active elliptical movement. So he was just basically saying, is that helpful for knee pain? Yeah, so it could help a little bit, but I, I'd be, yeah, so again, you're sitting there passively in a chair, and your legs are just kind of going like this, so your knee essentially is going like this. Maybe that helps a little bit. Overall circulation, maybe a little bit. Um, when you think of your circulation in your legs, which is an important factor to consider, especially people who have swelling and, and chronic swelling and edema in their legs, yeah, you would like to get that moving. Um, that might help a little bit, like with a lymphatic system. I'd be surprised if it does much. And it wouldn't do much in terms of like your venous return from your leg because really to get fluid moving, your muscles need to contract and pump. And so if you're sitting on a machine that's doing the work for you, your muscles are just sitting there flaccid, not doing anything. 
So I'd be surprised if it worked. I mean, again, I like to buy gizmos on TV sometimes and just check them for myself, um, depending on how much they cost. And then, of course, you can return anything, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't put too much hope in that. All right, good. So let me just do my last little bullet point here and tell you guys some other options for you. And then anyone who wants to hang out afterwards and talk to me, got time for specific questions. Uh, if I go home now, I'll have to put the kids to bed. So if I can hang out for another half hour, that would probably be helpful. I don't think my wife's watching, is she? You can't tell. OK, she already knows. Um, so good, so what's next? Um, for those of you who we've talked through uh, these issues about determining the root cause of your problem, what you can do about it, we do offer what's called a free uh, discovery visit, which is a free 30-minute consultation with one of our PTs here in the clinic. For those people watching at home, we are doing some of them virtually now over like Zoom and telehealth type stuff. We, it's a little, I think, more valuable if you come to the clinic. Um, so it's a 30-minute consultation. You ask the PT all of your questions. Their goal with that 30 minutes is to help you understand what the root cause of your problem is and to help you figure out if there's something that we can help you with to fix the problem. So it's a really nice way for us to get to know you and then give you some solid advice before you decide if doing PT with us is good for you. So it's a nice setup for the PTs who work here too because there's no pressure. It's not a sales gimmicky type thing. We don't need to collect a copay. We don't even need to run your insurance. We don't need a referral. We can just sit down with someone, talk to them, and tell them whether or not we think we can, that we can help them. Now, if we think we can help you, we're more than welcome to help you jump through the insurance hoops with referrals and stuff. Or A lot of folks already have a referral by the time they come in and do that. But it's a really nice way if you just have specific questions, they'll answer them for you. They'll talk to you about all those things. So that's a discovery visit. Um, if you do want one of those, I have the forms over here. Just fill one out and give it to Serena. She can help you right now, or we can call you back tomorrow and get you scheduled. Viewers at home, Viewers at home um, same thing. Thank you. Um, I would just either type in your email address below there or give us a call at the clinic tomorrow, 509-892-5442. Um, I'm not that tech savvy, but I can probably post that underneath the comments there. So, oh, Serena can do it. Okay, so yeah, just follow the prompts from Serena. So again, it's a really nice way uh, just to learn more about it before you dive in and take the plunge about working with a PT who you don't know yet and stuff like that. Yeah, or if you would, uh, just fill out the form there and pick a time and we'll call you either way. Yep, I'll, I'll hand those forms out uh, in just a minute here. And then, um, uh, I'm always open for emails, questions. I get quite a few emails on a weekly basis because I always put that in the newspaper and stuff like that. And I talk to people on the email list and say, hey, if you have a question, just let me know. I mean, we're in the business of helping people. So uh, I'm always, help I'm always uh, happy to answer questions. You can leave my email on there too. It's just luke at gordonphysicaltherapy.com. And um, any other resources I can get your way, I'm happy to do that for you. That's a wrap. That's the whole thing. So like I said, I'll stick around for a little while either way. If you have questions, uh, want to talk to me, then just let me know. Sound good? All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming.